public event for this committee to meet in person to ensure a transparent and open meeting is possible. We posted the meeting materials approximately one week in advance. We'll provide a recording of this meeting linked on our website and we'll take all votes by roll call. A few reminders, please stay muted when not talking. Unmute yourself at any point if you want to contribute to the conversation. Keep your video on if you're comfortable doing so, but if you're not, that's okay. You can also use the chat feature for any questions or comments you might have, and we'll be monitoring that throughout the meeting. Please be aware this meeting, including all messages in the chat box, will be recorded in compliance with the Illinois Open Meetings Act. For our guests and general public, we are very happy you could join us this morning, though we do ask that you please remain muted until the public comment section at the end of the meeting. Uh, with that, I'm going to move to the second agenda item uh, of changes and announcements. Henry uh, Guerrero is the new representative from the tollway. Henry is a Herbert? Yes. Oh, sorry, I think there's some background noise here. There we go. Okay. Henry is a traffic and revenue analyst at the tollway, and Amy Lee will continue to serve as an alternate when Henry is unable to attend. So moving to the to the third item, approval of our December minutes. Uh, uh, if you all could please review those minutes, and we're going to approve them. As I mentioned, we we do we are going to perform a roll call. Uh, we will use this roll call to approve the minutes and to also confirm attendance, which will save us some time. Committee members do not need to abstain from approving minutes from a previous meeting that you did not attend. So I will be looking here just for a motion in a second, and then Ryan will enter into the roll call. A motion to approve the minutes from December. Motion for Mike Burton. Second, second. bottomly. Ryan, if you could begin the roll call, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we'll start with Joe Alonzo from CDOT. Okay. Uh, Elaine Bottomley from Council of Mayors. Yes. Uh, Mike Burton from CNC. Okay. Yes. Raymond Drake from UPS. From Will County. Um, we know that Eric from Illinois Trucking is not here today. Um, Henry Guerrero from the Tollway. Approve if you can hear me. Yes, thank you. Um, Clark Carricker from the Illinois Chamber. Um, uh, Kazuya Kawamura from UIC. Oh, he actually already let me know that he wouldn't be here today. Um, Michael Kowal Kowalczyk from FHWA. John Loper from DuPage DOT. Present. Thank you. Uh, Libby Ogard. Uh, Adam Rod. I'm here. Thank you. Deanna Smith. I think you're muted, Deanna. Okay, I'll move on, but I think I see her in the... Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, there we go, Deanna. Okay. Um, and then uh, Herbert. Here and approved. 
Uh, Eric Valera, Varela. Eric is on another call uh, right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, Peter Wolf from T TX. Aaron approved. Thank you. Sam Wright from Cook County. Aaron approved. Okay, and that's everyone. Thank you. All right. All right. I just wanted to mention that uh, I want to verbalize my uh, attendance. Oh, thank you. So we're going to roll right in here. I, I know that uh, with the with the winter storm that we had uh, operationally we had some impact. So looking forward uh, later on this agenda to hearing from Adam Rod, but uh, of, of O'Hare's performance uh, through the weather and also just general COVID response. But first, uh, and it's exciting, I, we barely get to see each other, Aaron, <laughs> through these occasional freight meetings, but would love to hear an, an update uh, of the various CMAP board meeting uh, notes that, that you have and share any other news or insights that your great organization is doing. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, thanks for having me here. Um, you know, one of the, the things that I've been focused on is finding a way to make sure that I'm staying connected to our committees, but also that our committees are staying connected to our board um, and the MPO policy committee. So with that in mind, I just wanted to share a few things about projects that we have ongoing that might be of interest and offer you an opportunity to ask me questions about anything that's been on your mind too about CMAP. So um, a, a couple things that have been going on that have taken up uh, a number of our staff's time, um, but also that we're very excited about include a regional economic recovery task force. So at the request of the seven county board chairs in the city of Chicago, um, we have been convening stakeholders from across the region to talk about three sort of core areas, economic development across our region, workforce development coordination across our region, and tourism. You know, three areas that I think that really the, the region can work together on to develop some sustainable solutions on. So they kicked off in early December, but we've continued to have monthly meetings. This month we're having sort of small breakout group meetings and the goal is to really develop um, some tangible action steps and coordinated efforts that we can that we can really lift off the ground here in the next 12 to 18 months so we're not sort of working on a long-term report for the region or anything it's really about you know are there barriers are there legislative things we should be working on together you know are there some data needs that we could all be coordinating on together those are some examples of the types of things that we're, we're discussing with folks um, transportation is really the theme that runs through those three groups, right? Where businesses choose to locate, how people choose to get to where they need to go or how, how they don't have the options of how they can get to where they need to go. And tourism and how people get to those, you know, assets that we have across our region that we want people to get to. So our hope is that by bringing together the and suburban um, experts across the region, we can really um, leverage our collective voice together. The other thing that's been going on too is a mobility recovery plan um, that we are going to kick off here later this month. You know, we know that there have been considerable impacts to our transportation and our transit systems during the pandemic. And we've been engaging with the Regional Transportation Authority closely with us on this work. So our hope is again, that this can be an iterative <laughs> process that we spend about, you know, 24 months here thinking about not just getting back to business as usual, but identifying opportunities for us to better coordinate as a region on our transportation recovery efforts. Because I know the last thing that we all need is, you know, a Carmageddon or thinking about, you know, where are there opportunities for us to better coordinate our freight transportation works as well. I'll also just note that our February board meeting, um, our legislative agenda was approved. So we do a state legislative agenda and a federal legislative agenda. Um, the state legislative agenda identifies a couple recommendations from 2050. So really thinking about how we can dedicate funds for comprehensive regional planning, you know, that we can continue to support transparent and performance-based capital programming. Um, make sure that we have the data that we need to support decision making and accountability. Tax policy is another key um, element of our state agenda as well. And then thinking about how user fees can help support our revenues um, and help support the implementation of you know, asset management for our transportation system. The other thing that I'll just mention here that I'm sure many of you are aware of is that there's uh, the infra grants were released at the federal level. 
Um, there were a couple of changes compared to the fiscal year 2020 NOFO. And I, I'll just note that there were sort of two additional merit-based criteria added to the, the recommendations or the evaluation process, which were climate change and environmental justice, and also racial equity and reducing barriers to opportunity. So I know I just mentioned this because the freight committee, I know as we think about freight in this region, our role in our heads as to where we've been in terms of how we can help uh, our freight partners and how we can help local communities, right? It's how do you balance those two needs, right? There could be congestion, air quality concerns, but also the, the fact that we are a major hub for the United States here in terms of freight mobility. You know, we really know that that's important to our economy. So um, we're excited to see some of these, these changes included in the NOFO, but um, you know, interested in your thoughts as well. And, and I know many of you might be aware that I'm on the board of the Coalition for America's Gateways and Trade Corridors, CAGET, um, to help advocate for continued investment in freight infrastructure projects across our region. The last thing that I just wanted to note here too that I'm sure you're aware of, but the Census Bureau released some population estimates for the state. You know, we found that Illinois has lost nearly 80,000 residents in 2020, making it the seventh straight year of population decline. And I think as we think about how important our economy is and how important recovery is to our economy, you know, some of the things that we want to put in place and want to be talking about is how do we continue to address um, population loss by really investing in good, high quality jobs across our region, whether it's in the freight industry or some of our other expert areas that we have, whether it's health and um, health and biomedical tech and, and sector, or whether it's uh, the back office sector. So, uh, you know, we have a very diverse economy here and we know that, you know, we, we if we don't continue to invest in those areas, we will continue to, to lose population. So we'll do a further analysis. It's not the full 2020 decennial census, but um, again, you know, we sort of anticipated that we would lose population. Thankfully, our region didn't lose quite as much as the rest of downstate, but um, again, just wanted to make sure that, you know, that we're paying attention. If there's additional analysis or information that you need from us, please let us know. Any questions? We do have a question in the chat box uh, from Libby. She asked if CMAP is planning to submit an infra grant. No, CMAP's not um, submitting an infra grant. Um, I, I don't think we've ever actually submitted an infra grant. Tim, you can correct me if I'm wrong here. We, we typically don't implement things, but we'll often offer letters of support for partners who are submitting infra grants. Talon, did you have a question? Oh, no, I'm sorry, I thought you raised your hand. <laughs> trying to take all the social cues on Zoom here. Well, anyways, thank you so much for the time this morning. I know that I'm available to talk about freight. It's one of the areas that I appreciate and I uh, love to talk about. So I um, look forward to continuing the conversation at a future meeting and, and participating here today. Great, thank, thank you very much, Erin. And uh, uh, speaking of another person I haven't seen in a while, Laura, Laura Wilkinson, hi, good to see you. <laughs> Uh, ho hopefully we can uh, have one of these meetings sometime soon in the new office digs. I'm really looking forward, and I think all of the committee members are as well. So with that, uh, we're going to roll right into the fifth agenda item, federal and state legislative updates uh, from CMAP staff, including Anthony Cefali and Tim McMahon. So with that, gentlemen, please take it away. Great, uh, thank you. Good morning. My name is Tim McMahon. I uh, work on our federal affairs on the Gov Affairs team at CMAP. So I just want to take a few minutes to provide a brief overview of the freight specific items in both our federal agenda uh, for this session of Congress, as well as our shared principles for surface transportation reauthorization uh, that we developed over the last few months with 20 of our uh, regional transportation partners. So both the agenda and principles call for things that we have called for in the past and we will continue to call for, which is sustainable funding of the transportation system, uh, strengthening public transportation by supporting our much needed transit systems and the passenger rail network, uh, continued dedicated funding for freight projects uh, while eliminating multimodal caps and grant programs like infra, uh, increased transparency and performance-based principles across discretionary programs like infra and build, um, increased nationwide data collection for grade crossings and grade crossing blockages that is uh, transparent, regularly updated, and uses quality public data. Uh, and then lastly, the development of a comprehensive freight systems needs assessment 
which was not included uh, when the National Strategic Freight Plan was released last year. Uh, so we'd still like to see that developed. Um, so we'll be using both the agenda and the principles in the coming months for virtual DC meetings with our congressional delegation uh, and throughout this coming year as different bills get proposed, we will analyze them up against these documents um, as they're being considered. So where does service transportation reauthorization stand uh, right now? Well, last year, as you, as you all know, uh, the FAST Act, it was extended for a year to the end of December. Um, so that's kind of the, the timeline that we're under now. Uh, the president has held meetings with leaders of almost all of the authorizing committees uh, for transportation this past month. Um, Senate EPW, or Environment and Public Works Chair, Tom Carper has indicated he would like to have his portion of the bill out of committee by the end of May, which is a pretty short timeline, but it tracks with what the House committees have said about the spring. So we'll start to hear more of that. Um, and, and even with this week, right? So the Senate EPW committee will be having its first reauthorization hearing this coming Wednesday. Um, and other Senate authorizing committees, such as Senate Banking and Commerce, we haven't heard from, from them yet on, on where their timelines will be, but I would imagine that uh, EPW is, is where things will, will begin. Um, and then uh, there's still no word from Congress or the administration on how everyone plans to pay for the next bill, uh, which is not new. Congress has relied on general fund transfers uh, of non-transportation revenue infusions of $153 billion since 2008, and did so again uh, with this last one-year extension of the FAST Act. Um, and so lastly, just to uh, piggyback off of uh, what Aaron said, the last thing I wanted to touch upon was the infra notice of funding opportunity. So, and just give a few more of the, the specific dollars here. So 889 million in total funding is available for this round. 146 million of that total may be used under the multimodal cap for grants for freight rail, water, or other freight intermodal projects. Uh, the only non-highway portions of multimodal projects that don't count toward this cap limit under statute are rail highway grade crossing or grade separation projects. Um, and as in past years, 10% of total infra funding is reserved for small projects. So that's awards of a size of at least 5 million and then 90% will go to large projects. So that's awards of at least 25 million. And then separately, 25% of this funding will go to uh, rural areas. Um, and then as, as Aaron mentioned, uh, there's new criteria for environmental justice and climate change as well as, as racial equity. Um, and then I just wanted to kind of flag that there will be a webinar today by, uh, hosted by USDOT. This is the first webinar for the InfraGrant program. Um, if you'd like to learn more about it, uh, and applications for this are due in, on March 18th. Uh, and I can uh, share that webinar link in the chat. Uh, and now I'll turn it over to Anthony for the state side. Thanks, Tim. I appreciate that. Hey everyone, my name is Anthony Safali. I work for Gordon Smith here in the Government Affairs Group and we spend most of our time in Springfield. Um, unfortunately, a uh, session is taking place, or maybe fortunately, depending on how you look at it, um, remotely for the time being, but we are still monitoring all of the developments and we're using our main strategic documents in order to further some of CMAP's policy goals. Um, Aaron already went over some of the agenda, but I will I want to go over some of those things in a little bit more detail and also point you to um, on our website, we have a number of legislative and policy statements, which also include capital funding principles, which is a document that we go into session with every year in order to make sure that we are grounding any revenue and transportation conversations around some of some agreed upon on to 2050 principles, as well as the on to 2050 legislative framework, which is kind of our guide for when legislation comes in, what we what we do to review it and make sure it stands up to some of the research um, that we put together in the development of on to 2050. Um, the primary document that Gordon and I use in Springfield is the legislative agenda, though. These topics uh, that have been in there since I have started at CMAP, um, they have not changed too much because they are, they are policy-driven systemic needs for the state to address. 
Um, Aaron went over those, as I said, but I just want to touch on them again very quickly. Um, and of course, anytime, if you guys have questions, um, feel, free, feel free to reach out and then we'll go over the session calendar as well. Um, a big thing for CMAP is always providing dedicated funds for comprehensive regional planning, and that is a statewide effort. Um, all of the MPOs receive a state match, so we are, we, we, are, we are advocating for full funding of planning and planning activities. Um, CMAP, as the region's data hub, supports transparent, equitable, performance-based capital programming, as well as collecting and providing the data needed to support decision-making and accountability. These are really our big state value adds. Um, we go in there every year with the processes that we've developed through STP um, and some of the other work that we're doing around planning and just kind of share those resources with the General Assembly and make sure that we are collecting the most up-to-date and relevant data so that they can then make the most uh, wise policy decisions based on what's available. Um, two big ones for this group, reforming tax policy to strengthen communities. We look very specifically um, at how the state collects and then disperses taxes. Um, that's everything from LGDF to sales tax. Um, and we are looking for broad policy solutions that, that, that really help communities fund um, the changes that they want to see and fund the infrastructure that they need. Um, obviously, COVID has thrown, thrown some new challenges our way, but really systemically, it's just highlighted the challenges that existed before. So when we talk about reforming tax policy to strengthen communities, um, we really want to get at what was preventing communities from funding infrastructure before and how we fix that going forward. Um, and finally, for this group, implementing user fees and regional revenues to sustainably fund the multimodal transportation system. And that's everything from looking for state contributions to create programs, um, to exploring road usage charges and congestion pricing um, throughout the region. We CMAP policy research shows uh, is kind of pushing us down the direction of more user fees as um, as as the state motor fuel tax is only a proxy for how people use the transportation system in general. Um, although the, the House just passed rules for how they can proceed remotely for this session, uh, the Senate has had them in place since last session. Um, committee hearings are happening remotely and bill deadlines as of right now have not been pushed back. Um, CMAP staff, we are collecting and analyzing bills as they come in. Um, there's a mix of new initiatives, but a lot of the same stuff that if you're familiar with the General Assembly and how they proceed, a lot of similar initiatives have been filed this year um, to in years past. Uh, so I do anticipate some changes, um, but overall things are proceeding um, as they have previously. Um, I would be happy to take any questions about session. Um, and Tim, I think you will be available for federal stuff as well. Yeah. Anthony, that was very comprehensive. I, I, I will kick this off just by flagging on the state side uh, with bill introductions, HB 2524 uh, by Representative Hoffman uh, that was introduced last week. Uh, it is a bill that would regulate train length uh, no longer than 8,500 feet. That would have very real world implications, uh, obviously for the North American freight rail network. Our, our trains with distributed power are getting a lot longer to enhance our network capacity. And our, our grounds for this is this is another attempt at regulating interstate commerce. This is a big deal just as uh, two years ago, when the Illinois legislature passed two-person crew bill requiring two, two people in every locomotive cab, uh, under similar lines that it was federally preempted, we won in federal district court. It's on appeal by the Illinois Attorney General. But HB 2524 will be front and center for the, the Illinois Railroad Association this uh, legislative session. One other bill that could have implications for the great work that CMAP had done for a grade crossing uh, analysis of candidates for grade separations in the Illinois Commerce Commission Grade Crossing Protection Fund is HB 813 by Representative Robin Gable. This was a bill that was introduced last session and has been reintroduced. Uh, the Railroad Association is working with her to amend it. We have concerns. Uh, this would extend the protections provided uh, 
up to a thousand feet from grade crossings for trespass trespasser fatality abatement efforts and uh, the the funds potentially would come from the grade crossing protection fund which is already oversubscribed with needs for grade separations many of which cmaps work has identified that still need additional funds so just wanted to flag those two for you and then open it up uh, to uh, the committee if there were any other questions for either of them thank you very much for that we are tracking both of those bills so um we'll see where they go Ray or Mike, any uh, because we don't have Eric uh, participating, uh, any any particular legislation that uh, you all are monitoring uh, for implications in the trucking world? Uh, this is Mike Burton. Uh, really, not at the state level, but at the federal level. Um, you know, with uh, the independent contractors, continues to be a big issue from our industry. seen anything of major concern at this point in the state of Illinois. Uh, Matt Hart or Eric might have a little, maybe some things that are on their radar that are maybe would affect other aspects of trucking, but I don't, I don't, I have not seen anything yet. Certainly the railroads, I think, have some concerns. Yes, H HR2, yes. But, okay, well, great. Uh, one more call, any other, any other questions for CMAP staff? Seeing none, uh, we'll move to our sixth agenda item, air cargo during the COVID-19 pandemic with uh, our great committee member, Adam Rod, Assistant Commissioner of Planning. Um, for the Chicago Department of Aviation. We'll provide an overview of a HARE's general status and then dive into specific issues relating to air cargo over the past year, including e-commerce surges, vaccine distribution, and uh, most topical, the, the blizzard that we experienced last week. Adam, take it away, please. Thanks, Herbert. Uh, great to be with everyone again, uh, for sure, uh, at least virtually as the extraordinary times continue here. Uh, Ryan and I had been talking a few weeks back that uh, particularly with the prominence uh, of air cargo during the pandemic, this would be a, a very good time to give everyone a comprehensive update uh, of, of what we've been doing uh, these last uh, several months. Uh, and um, I'll also do my best to, to draw from my national affiliations, including this current uh, cargo chair at Airports Council International to sprinkle in some national and international perspective. Uh, of all the uh, COVID activity right now. Um, but first, uh, I think to really best understand our, our performance, uh, our capabilities now uh, in good times and bad, uh, we should take a quick review uh, of who we are, uh, as many of you know, uh, what this great transportation asset means to, to Chicago normally before uh, how it's responded uh, during the pandemic. So Ryan, thanks so much for the help on the slides. Uh, next slide. Very quickly, um, many of you know, we of course are an agency of the city of Chicago, uh, but we run as an enterprise fund, uh, basically as a self-sustained autonomous corporation uh, with no local or state taxpayer dollars. Uh, federal grants and mechanisms are certainly part of any airport's operation. Uh, but we are essentially a, a very big corporation at that, as you can see some of those superlative statistics, uh, essentially running one of the top 10 largest airport systems in the world, uh, at least during normal times. Next slide. Uh, I've mentioned this to some extent before. I think it's important to emphasize uh, again that, you know, unless you're Dubai or Shanghai with massive central planning and billions of dollars to throw any direction you want, uh, with little opposition. Uh, it takes a lot of history and uh, hard work uh, to build up who you are. And, and certainly, as Aaron hinted at before, we're very, very proud of our DNA for business and transportation, um, uh, thanks to our central geography and massive infrastructure uh, that's been built up over time. I think we all know waterways, of course, came first, then, of course, the nation's railroad hub. 
And we take very seriously uh, that legacy for our airport system to, to get the job done and be a center of our nation's uh, economy uh, in good times and bad. And one of the strongest statistics, uh, particularly right now, that businesses uh, across the Europe and Asia and all over the world are very aware of uh, for Chicago's prominence is that red circle you can see there. Uh, today, you can reach about one third of the US marketplace and population uh, within a one day truck drive uh, of O'Hare. And that's been a big story during the pandemic as well. We'll talk about more stats. Uh, next slide. You've heard some of these um, strong statistics in the past. Uh, we've basically been at record volumes these last couple of years before the pandemic. We're one of the 20 largest uh, air cargo airports in the world. Uh, number six in the US, but I always have to put that asterisk there because that includes uh, Anchorage, Memphis, and Louisville, uh, which are very, very specialized uh, cargo hubs. Uh, in reality, we're neck and neck with Los Angeles and Miami in terms of uh, vol top volume. And more importantly, I always like to say we are the number one cargo airport uh, in all of the Americas by value, processing over $200 billion a year in imports and exports. That's a big number. It, it's such a big number, and it's an amazing number given that air cargo uh, is just, you know, maybe 1% or 2% of any movement in the supply chain at one time, and yet it has so much value ranking among the two or three largest uh, ports in the United States by value, uh, and that's really a great story for Chicago. Uh, today, to move all this cargo, we have about 2 million square feet of airside cargo facilities, meaning airplanes can pull up to them, another 2 million square feet of, of cargo facilities just on the airport, fueling all of those jobs, and we can handle about 40 jumbo freighters, over 40 actually, at one time. That's a big number, and it's also been a huge story uh, during the pandemic as well as our cargo ramps are on overdrive. Next slide. Uh, a little bit more detail uh, on our normal uh, capabilities. Uh, I talked about just how at the top of the pyramid, air cargo really is in terms of the most valuable and leading goods that we rely on. Certainly a story during the pandemic as well. Normally, uh, like most ports in the US, there's a trade deficit at, at O'Hare. Only about 25% of our cargo value is, uh, is exports. But normally, believe it or not, if you group those categories together, uh, medical supplies and medicines uh, was the top category by value. So those capabilities were already in place uh, needed for the pandemic in terms of PPE and medical equipment and things like that. We are also one of the flagship cargo gateways for, for most uh, cargo carriers uh, overseas. That's played a big role in knowing that they can rely on Chicago as a base uh, for distribution in good times and bad. Um, regardless of your feelings of trade policy with China, uh, over the past decade, it's been our number one trading partner at O'Hare by a mile, over 25% of volume and value at O'Hare. So if that takes a hit, you're going to see that in, in Chicago as well. Uh, although I think actual trade number, numbers is up with China over the last year, um, uh, including with all that PPE and such. All of this adds up to a gigantic economic hinterland as part of this huge edge city economy that, that Chicago is. Next slide. Uh, just a very quick review of uh, where cargo is being processed at the airport. Many of you might be familiar with this. There's a south and, a, and now there's a north for the past few years. Um, I'll uh, go to the next slide and just show you the south real quick. Uh, this is a picture of how our south uh, cargo ramps work. You'll notice a lot of traditional legacy uh, carrier airlines that still populate them, uh, whereas opposed to the next slide, uh, you'll see in the Northeast here, which is our newest state-of-the-art cargo campus, uh, that there's been a shift in who the primary tenant is. It's actually now more the cargo handler, the, the companies that support the cargo, the cargo airlines movement. And this has especially been helpful to a lot of overseas carriers knowing that they don't have to make a large investment in real estate or a lease to get the same benefit out of O'Hare. They can just hook up with one of these uh, handlers and be in their space. And that's a big story on the Northeast, which has been extremely busy lately. You probably also heard in the last several weeks that that phase three, that piece in red there, um, a little behind where it should be, uh, that, that lease update has been uh, passed through city council, meaning that finally we'll, it'll be under construction very shortly here in spring uh, to be finished by next year. And it can't come soon enough. Uh, any of you, anyone who knows me knows my stress already is where are we going to build the next uh, airside cargo campus 
to stay competitive on top of things. I won't bore you with that stress at the moment, but things are, are very busy right now. Next slide. Just a nice shot of what it actually looks like uh, in person. Uh, this is the phase one of the Northeast, the newest ramp here. That's a, almost a 500,000 square foot building. You can see a couple of tails here from China and Russia. This ramp has been extremely busy uh, overall during the pandemic. Just always like to throw that shot in. Next slide. A reminder to everyone, a real key piece of what's happening now before we get into some details of the pandemic. Normally, of course, uh, you can reach all corners of the globe nonstop from Chicago uh, and just about anywhere you want to go uh, in North America nonstop for sure. Uh, in fact, we are so connected that OAG has called us the most connected airport in the Americas for several years now. In fact, we're really just neck and neck with London Heathrow as being the most connected airport in the world. Now, that's great for passengers, which is certainly down right now in activity, but I want to remind everyone that normally in these passenger planes and every single one of them is cargo. And as you may know, we call that belly cargo, and that's down right now. And we don't have enough cargo planes overall to make up for that for that belly loss. It's been a big story um, worldwide, and we're certainly doing our best to keep up. And as a great cargo airport like O'Hare, we have that ability. But uh, reminder that cargo really relies on passenger airplanes too. Next slide. Just a, a very quick overview, um, certainly challenging fiscal times um, for all of us, uh, and although some of these agreements and funding mechanisms are already in place, any airport in the world, especially a major global airport like O'Hare, that, um, that doesn't focus on moving forward with its capital program and, and future development is going to stagnate and decline. And of course, we never ever want to see that, and we won't allow that to happen at CDA. Uh, just a quick reminder of all this capital work that continues, even though with a little more temperance and prudence right now, but still moves forward. The, la the co for current name of our capital program, most people are aware it's been O'Hare 21 for the past three or so years is what we've called that. And um, uh, it is on the heels of the OMP, the O'Hare Modernization Program. Next slide. Which I, I love this uh, exhibit. Uh, really shows that uh, in the end, the OMP, even though it had terminal space in it, focused more on the airfield and building those new runways. And what a story it's been uh, over all these years. You can see this dramatic change without any effect to over, uh, overall operations of changing all those old crisscross runways into this modern, sleek, efficient, six parallel uh, uh, runways. We keep two diagonals just in case of alternating weather conditions. Uh, but this is a dramatic story for many, many decades to come to reduce system impact delays substantially. Uh, and building four new brand new runways in just over a decade is an amazing story for any city in the world, uh, basically for mostly relatively on budget and on time. So this has been a, a great story. And the successor to the OMP as it wraps up, we did build our last new runway last year, a little less pop and, pomp and circumstance as normal. Uh, because of the pandemic, uh, but it is open now, and we're finally just extending one more runway to basically close out what everyone has, has heard as being the OMP. And then we move into more into O'Hare 21, which is the next slide, which centers around a lot of new terminal space. So I just want to we'll focus on that, that we are still planning, we are still moving forward uh, on that. Maybe the next slide's a little bit better to summarize all this. Uh, this is the order by color. Uh, the L, Concourse L is essentially finished uh, in, as an addition. If you come to the airport now, you'll see Terminal 5 under uh, construction now. The next construction will be the two satellite terminals and finally a brand new Terminal 2, which has a new name, the O'Hare Global Terminal. Most importantly throughout all this, back to the passenger airline side, is uh, we're shifting around airlines to be more efficient for connections. Uh, American stays in three, United uh, keeps one, but they will share this O'Hare Global Terminal as a new international uh, terminal uh, for seamless connections throughout the world. All other airlines eventually, it's already started, will be move o moved over to Terminal 5. So Terminal 5 is no longer the international terminal, it's just a terminal within this system. And all of this, uh, again, temperance and prudence, I haven't put specific years as excited as we were to talk about them maybe a couple of years ago, most of this should be in place by the turn of the decade. So throughout this decade, this construction will take place. And finally, the O'Hare Global Terminal should be open just as we uh, turn the corner into 2030.
So it's a lot of the a huge change uh, overall on the passenger side as well. Next slide. Uh, I got to remind everyone too that it's not just about building the infrastructure and the economic benefits. We always think uh, uh, at, at CDA about what we in planning world, of course, call the triple bottom line, building economically, building responsibly, socially, and building, of course, sustainably as well. Uh, we're very excited about the design teams that are, are building those new terminals. Studio ORD is that consortium led by Jeannie Gang. Uh, that tiny architecture firm, Skidmore, Owens & Merrill, is working on the design for the um, satellite terminals. And uh, we're very, very proud that these will be great places to be, lots of amenities besides being economically important to the city and, of course, being built and operated sustainably. CDA actually helped literally write the book on sustainable airport uh, manuals that many that template is used by many airports around uh, the country. So we're proud of that. We have to always mention that. Next slide. And um, uh, it's not just about uh, what we're doing on the airfield. No airport is in a bubble, of course. It's always about improving access and um, uh, continuing to make connections to the airport better. Many of you are aware on the west side that involves the entire El Elgin O'Hare. Uh, project, which continues, uh, it'll eventually bypass the 294 to the south and to I-90 to the north, and will have a connection into the airfield, although not necessarily a, a terminal at first. So we still continue to work on that on a weekly basis uh, with the tollway, and that progress will continue again probably throughout most of this decade before it's all um, said and done in, in phases. Uh, so we're excited about that, but I do want to emphasize to everyone, especially um, uh, a breakthrough again on the east side, on the on the current front door of the airport for Interstate 190. Uh, after struggling to get um, funding for many, many, many years, finally we had a breakthrough with IDOT uh, last couple of years to program funding, which will eventually break this 50 plus year old bottleneck uh, old system that comes into the airport. Most of you have experienced before, and it's not fun. Uh, that bottleneck is uh, will be broken with express lanes and a better set of geometrics coming in and out of the airport um, for sure. Construction will not begin yet for at least a year or more from now, uh, probably done in the area of around 2027-ish, if all goes well. Uh, and there'll be a lot of pain uh, for all of us. Uh, in the meantime for that construction, but it will be very much worth it. So that's when you see a lot of construction at the front door of the airport, that's what's going on on I-190, improving it. Next slide. Okay, and uh, then a little less than a year ago, we saw the, basically the pandemic set in full time by about March or April. What happened during all this, including at O'Hare? Well, passenger traffic plummeted as much as 95%. At, at many airports uh, at O'Hare was in the area of about 90%. And even though you've seen traffic get a little bit more uh, back to normal, kind of uh, more traffic, it's still down about 50 or 60% from what normal activity is uh, at any given airport, including O'Hare. Now, as I mentioned, the overall cargo volumes also fell, uh, that air cargo fell too, because of all that loss in belly cargo and passenger planes. But if you're already a, a cargo hub like O'Hare was with freighters, those freighter and integrator traffic, integrator being UPS, FedEx, et cetera, um, that traffic absolutely exploded uh, during the pandemic. So the cargo ramps have been extremely busy. Air cargo essentially was the reliable go-to to keep the critical supply chain moving, as we've all seen in the news, and all those emergency shipments moving as well. Land and sea ports are not only slower, but of course they're more prone to emergency border concerns or closures. Air cargo did not really see that as much. Also, another big issue to seeing all this extra activity as the pandemic set in over many months, e-commerce uh, absolutely exploded, which of course, in many cases, those parcels require air cargo to curb a lot of the bleeding and to meet this demand that increased on the cargo side, about 150 passenger airlines converted hundreds of their planes to freighters. This includes American and United Airlines as well. Uh, whether they were putting cargo on seats or taking the seats out, um, it, it's really been an interesting story to see um, the tr transition that a lot of airlines have been doing to try to get by. The strong air, car air cargo demand at O'Hare has also meant a lot more crowded operations uh, on the airfield. Uh, if you've taken a look at recently on any of our cargo ramps, you'll see it's very crowded, including a lot more trucks right now. We're doing everything we can ad hoc to help our tenants uh, get by, but it is very crowded right now. 
And while all these car cargo airlines are struggling to keep up with the pandemic demand, no doubt the passenger airlines are still suffering on. Hopefully that's going to continue to get better by, and better month by month here for all of us, including at O'Hare. Uh, the CARES Act has helped uh, airlines and airports a lot, but no doubt it could not stop all the concessions, adjustments, and cutbacks um, in the aviation world uh, that, again, will hopefully uh, get better and better uh, as we hit each month. Um, IATA and a lot of other forecasts, uh, professional forecasts, are essentially looking to 2023 to see significant economic and air traffic recovery as well. Uh, of course, vaccines will continue to be a big part of that story as well. Next slide. All right, uh, a couple of sidebars here uh, on how we're responding. Uh, some of the couple of the bigger stories of how we're responding, which are lasting into the long term here at airports. Uh, E-commerce is a big story. Uh, E-commerce permanence in our economy, I think, really matured uh, when the pandemic hit. No, uh, E-commerce was already about 10 or 15 percent of all retail transactions in the developed world prior to the pandemic. But uh, and the growth was already about a healthy clip of five or ten percent uh, in the developed world. If you look back from 2019 into 2024, well, all of that growth basically consolidated in a matter of uh, a few months over summer of last year. Uh, a real crazy story. And in fact, um, air cargo wise, we've seen it easily up over 50 percent um, than the year before. I think if you look at some of the Amazon stories and things like that, uh, tra uh, that amount of transactions and such is, has doubled or more in many cases. Uh, it really is uh, perhaps at the continued expense of brick and mortar retail, a huge story uh, moving forward of how the economy ha has shifted and how airports are seeing that as well. It, this is all translating at the airport too, as I mentioned earlier, more cargo airlines, especially integrators, trying to keep up with all that parcel demand. A great example at O'Hare is Amazon Air, Amazon's airline, which, as many of you are familiar with, uh, started operations, particularly at smaller airports. They could control their destiny a little bit better, but they certainly have branched out as they've grown to larger airports. They started at O'Hare around March of last year with one flight to their Cincinnati hub, and that service very, very quickly, within a matter of a couple of weeks even, um, tripled, uh, and it continues to be uh, on uh, over overflowing right now in terms of traffic. So even as GDP has contracted throughout the developed world during the pandemic, e-commerce, uh, that end of the economy is, continues to skyrocket. And airports like us at O'Hare, we need to be prepared about a handle that new opportunity, including you know, new cargo facilities, uh, perhaps involving more e-commerce as time goes on. It's a very real possibility. There are some unique design challenges to that, um, such as more truck queuing, uh, literally a larger square floor and other things. Um, so this is a, a real story that will continue to shape cargo development down the road. Next slide. And you can't uh, overshadow this subject. If there was ever a singular challenge uh, matching economic and societal need uh, or a challenge for the supply chain, it absolutely brings into light uh, how we getting uh, about doing this great vaccine distribution of 2021. Well, airports, um, they're going to have a significant, if not substantial, role in the delivery of all these millions of vaccines. Uh, besides uh, monitoring and reimbursements, though, I do want to point out the difference a little bit in administration without getting too political with you. Uh, the former administration's Operation Warp Speed was only really an idealistic outline. Uh, basically, if you if you look at it very carefully, it was an idealistic outline, and that, that was good, but it, it didn't mean that there was a direct federal role in, in assuring the goals for distributing these vaccines. So basically the details of vaccine distribution fell on carriers and the contractors as part of that monitoring and reimbursement process. I think the new administration is doing its best to try to re redefine its role with a little more push uh, on those supply chain logistics uh, for sure. Um, you've seen that a lot in the news uh, lately. Um, most vaccine brands, uh, they're going to have some foreign production or distribution requiring that air cargo. And of course, uh, in many cases, dry ice uh, for that cool transport as well. IATA estimates that one Boeing 777 freighter, it can carry just over 1 million vaccine doses at a time. And that sounds like a lot, but compare that to the millions and billions of doses required to be delivered. Uh, plus all that supporting equipment, it's not just the doses, it's the syringes and things like that. 
And believe it or not, to date, the only real federal guidance we've gotten at airports in terms of what our central role would be uh, in supporting vaccine distribution uh, from the airport's perspective uh, is just like a couple of page uh, memo from the FAA to tweak our operations. So really right now, and again, it depends on redefining uh, federal and perhaps more local role uh, as well, vaccine movement really falls on existing capacity of our airport cargo tenants, our airlines, uh, especially those who are ready with cool storage. Luckily, many of them are. And it's really the operation on them. One of the biggest aspects they're also taking care of themselves is security. It's a major concern for such a valuable uh, medical product. Uh, and you've probably seen the news that so there's been talk, and it certainly exists today, secret locations for some of the storage, decoys, contingencies, uh, sophisticated GPS tracking, even police escorts to, to make sure that we meet that goal and, and do it safely as well. And next slide. And so uh, in summary, uh, what does this all mean? What's the bottom outlook uh, right now uh, for O'Hare and, and other airports? Well, as I mentioned throughout this whole presentation, who would have ever thought that cargo planes would steal the spotlight over passenger planes at, at major global airports like O'Hare? It's really been quite a story, and it's caused a lot of airport authorities uh, to take a pause uh, of how they could perhaps enhance their cargo role moving on as part of their, their full picture at an airport. Luckily for at O'Hare, we've already been one of the top global uh, cargo airports in the world, but it really is quite a story of, of cargo planes stealing the spotlight from passenger planes. Of course, we all want passenger planes to get back to normal. And along with the U.S. economy, absolutely, U.S. airports will recover and thrive. They always do. Uh, over 60 years of jet travel, whether it's 9-11 or uh, the worst recession you can throw at us, uh, airports and, and our economy will recover for sure. We're very confident in that. Um, Nevertheless, uh, as that happens, caution and temperance toward our operations and capital planning, as I mentioned earlier, are undoubtedly going to continue to be prudent for sure. Uh, the big story here, worldwide airport revenues were down over $100 billion. That's about 65% last year. And Chicago is part of that picture. So right now, the most we can do is certainly work with our busy cargo airlines and other tenants to help them get by, whether that's extra space, uh, helping with vaccines, things like that. We're looking at everything we can do to help our tenants get by. As I mentioned, we're going to need more cargo development uh, over time, but right now we're going to have to balance that with other recovering concerns uh, for the next couple of years. Um, I, I want to end on a personal note, really important to say, I think, uh, over and over. Uh, as much as we talk economic statistics and, and infrastructure and things like that, this time right now is really about improving and saving lives. And I certainly offer my prayers again to the thousands of lives lost to COVID-19, especially as we hit the grim 500,000 milestone, uh, I believe, yesterday. Um, it, it's really important just to say again to everyone, please, please do your part to be safe and responsible as all of our individual actions are going to add up to a faster recovery for us all. And uh, as many of you know me, I could go on and on and on forever uh, on O'Hare, but uh, I think I left a few extra minutes here. If anyone has any questions or comments, or if you think I missed anything, uh, by all means, please let me know. Thanks so much. Adam, that was fantastic. Uh, please, uh, for the committee, any questions? I have a question. Excuse me, Joe from CDOT. Again, Adam, I'll quote. Herbert's comments was a great presentation. Thank you. And I know it was a lot to cover, but I wanted to actually speak about Midway and whether or not there's any handling of cargo at Midway. And I know postal mail was the only cargo commodity that I knew was handled by Midway in the past. And wondering if it still is and if there's any plans for any other types of cargo to be handled at Midway. A fantastic question, uh, Joe. We need to bring you over here to CDA because uh, that was a wonderful uh, promotion that, it, of course, we are not just O'Hare, we are also Midway. But on the cargo end, overall, um, remember, Midway's runways are just not long enough to handle those modern um, supersized jumbo freighters. And so when the shift eventually happened um, in around 1960 to O'Hare, um, the uh, the End of cargo really, for the most part, happened at, at Midway. Don't get me wrong, uh, we talked about belly cargo before. In every single passenger plane, mostly on Southwest Airlines uh, at Midway, 
there is cargo and there is a robust uh, domestic cargo uh, operation out there, but it's less than 1% of the overall volume at O'Hare. And uh, Southwest, as you say, Joe, does move mail and other smaller cargo parcels uh, every single day, and, and they do a very good job at it, including as they started at O'Hare in this last month as well. Um, but the real story there is uh, the, the dedicated freighter operations and a lot of the, the specialized uh, work you've seen, including during the pandemic, is really happening more at, um, at O'Hare. The mail will continue at Midway, but uh, O'Hare is really where the center of, of the cargo story in Chicago is for air cargo. Okay, thanks, Adam. Other questions? Okay, with that, Adam, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, a lot of great details there, and hopefully, again, when things return to normal, uh, the the committee really enjoyed the O'Hare tour several years back, and given that of all the progress and changes since then and how it is an economic engine for the region, love to get back out there at some point in time. Absolutely, thanks so much, Herbert. Um, certainly, you can always reach me offline, any other questions or through Ryan, thanks again. Thank you, Adam. All right, we'll move right into our seventh agenda item, the safety action agenda by Victoria Jacobson, uh, and she'll discuss the, the safety action agenda project. Victoria. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me this morning. Um, yes, my name is Victoria Jacobson. I am um, going to talk a little bit about a uh, new initiative at CMAP that is, um, you know, is a perfect segue from Adam's presentation when we talk about safety. Um, it's at the top of everyone's minds right now, and it's um, certainly something that CMAP is um, uh, anxious to address. I'm going to talk about some trends and um, other topics around traffic safety today. Next slide, please, Ryan. So the CMAP Travel Safety Action Agenda is in response to a number of concerns that have been um, developing over the course of many years. Certainly we saw new concerns arise in 2020 with the pandemic, but um, this is a response to a rise in traffic fatalities on our region's transportation system um, starting well before the pandemic. Um, CMAP is um, federally mandated to set um, regional traffic safety targets, um, and we do that through our transportation committee. Um, and we do that in close, in close coordination with the Illinois Department of Transportation. And we have um, not been meeting those targets. So it was one of the um, impetuses for this work. Um, in addition to those um, trends, we're also seeing growing concerns about traffic safety on local roads in our region. Um, you know, the Illinois Department of Transportation manages our national highway system and, and many uh, of our major roads, but um, there are a, a huge percentage of local roads that may benefit from um, additional traffic safety um, design and, and management. Um, there are also some new concerns regarding equity when it comes to traffic safety that we wanted to include in this discussion. Um, there are also some safety dimensions to our concerns about climate change, whether that's increased flooding or other concerns um, relating to um, the, the impacts of climate change. And finally, we're seeing growing numbers of and interest in active transportation modes. That was a trend that started before the pandemic and was certainly kind of accelerated during the pandemic. So we wanted to address traffic safety from a very clear multimodal perspective. Next slide, please. Um, I'll quickly go over some of the, the major trends that we have been monitoring that led to this work. This is um, a graph of traffic fatalities in our region. You can see the blue lines are the raw numbers of annual fatalities. And then the orange line is a five-year average, which is um, often how we uh, monitor the trend of fatalities, given the high degree of randomness. So you can see that in about 2014, we started to see an upward tick of um, our five-year average of traffic fatalities. So not only is that 
ultimately moving in the wrong direction. Um, our safety performance targets require us or, or have been set at a 2% annual reduction. So we're certainly not meeting the, um, the annual reduction target either. Next slide, please. The other trend that is worrisome is the growing number of bicycle and pedestrian fatalities and serious injuries in our region. So we're seeing a growing number of the fatalities represented by those on non-motorized modes, vulnerable modes that are um, more exposed to traffic safety issues. So again, you can see the orange trend line, that's the five-year average kind of ticking upwards um, since also about 2014. Next slide, please. And then, as I mentioned, you know, we're, we're looking at the opportunity to assist on local roads. Um, you can see here that the orange is the state system roadways and the blue line are um, local roads. So in every category, except for fatalities, the local roads are experiencing very high levels of crashes. They're obviously much more roadway mileage that belongs to local authorities, counties, and local municipalities. Um, it's not surprising that the total fatalities are higher on the state system crashes because that includes the highway system. So the higher speeds generally lead to higher rates of fatalities in our crashes. Um, but this is also a, a concern that we wanted to address, that there are a large percentage of crashes happening on our local roads and, and how can CMAP um, help um, assist communities in tackling this. Next slide, please. So as we solve or attempt to solve our traffic safety concerns, it's important to frame the work under our onto 2050 goals, because um, there are, as you all know, traffic safety is a complex topic and you can't make a decision on a specific topic without influencing it in another area. So it's important to frame um, this work under the categories of inclusive growth, which is one of CMAP's um, guiding principles. The goal here is to make a transportation system that works better for everyone, regardless of age, ability, mode, income, race, gender. Um, we want our transportation system to be more efficient and equitable. That means investing in safety infrastructure for all modes in all areas equitably. We want to specifically call out um, the, the call and on to 2050 to um, support designs that reduce speeding in our region. And we have also identified a goal in our plan to eliminate all traffic deaths by 2050. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that goal later. Next slide. So resilience is this other piece that I mentioned earlier. This is about not only climate change resilience, but also kind of economic and certainly a, a safety resilience piece. Um, we saw um, in not only a, a move towards um, um, in, 20, in 2020, we saw a transportation system that wasn't very resilient to um, a change in travel demand. So um, we saw high rates of speeding on our roadways um, that may have been that may have happened as a result of um, reduced congestion and reduced demand for travel on our roadways. And that led to a very high jump in traffic fatalities on our roadways in our region. So um, it, there was a new element of resiliency that we wanted to try to incorporate in this work. In addition, we want to be um, keep our eye on supporting green infrastructure and the safety of climate friendly modes. Next slide, please. And then finally, the, the last guiding principle of onto 2050 is this prioritized investment piece and and CMAP plays a large role in our region in supporting project development. So we want to make sure that as we do that, we are elevating safety projects appropriately. You know, how can we um, support good projects, not only map selects um, and helps to fund, but also in the projects that advance locally. Next slide, please. So all of this led to the development of our, the mission statement for our regional traffic safety action agenda. 
the, the mission here is to address long-term regional traffic safety in a comprehensive, equitable, data-driven, and collaborative way. We want to center this work around CMAP's core values, the implementation levers, and our on to 2050 guiding principles, which I just went over. Um, we want to support and expand the work and reach of our partners. There's a lot of incredible safety work going on among all of our partners in the region. We don't want to you know, reinvent the wheel. We want to build and expand upon a lot of the safety work that's already happening. And finally, we want to help build a culture of safety in the region. Um, we hope that the, this safety action agenda is the beginning of a longer term regional traffic safety um, awareness and coalition. Next slide. So you all are aware, I'm sure, of the, the, the ease of traffic safety. Traditionally, um, they have been engineering, education, emergency services, and enforcement. Um, those are all going to be important topics that we discuss in this work. Um, we are adding equity, which is um, something that's happening um, across the board in safety, um, to understand not only how traffic safety enforcement um, can be um, done more equitably, but also ensure that as we recommend and improve the safety of our roadways, that that is being done um, in, a, in a geographically equitable way. Next slide, please. So I'll go over each of these briefly here um, in a minute, but there are four components of our safety action agenda, people, information, practice and deliverables. Next slide. Start with people. So we are starting with our first traffic safety resource group, which kicked off about a month ago. Um, these, this is a group of regional partners from all different fields um, of all the different E's that I just mentioned with expertise and a broader perspective of traffic safety. Um, it is a short-term mission-driven group that will meet uh, uh, six or eight times or so over the next year, year or two years to determine the framework and the ways in which CMAP can really move the needle on traffic safety in our region. They'll help inform not only what research we tackle, but also the implement implementation tools that we deliver to our region. Um, as I mentioned, we'll have we have representatives from all the categories that I mentioned, all the four E's and beyond, including equity. And we hope that this traffic safety resource group is the seed of this long-term coalition that we have in mind. Next slide, great. So the second piece is this data research and best practices. Um, this is meant to really understand what pieces of information we have about regional traffic safety and hopefully cultivate new sources of data and research for our region. Um, data is actually you know, a huge piece of what CMAP does and does really well. So um, if there is an opportunity for us to not only gather the data that we need, but also deliver that data to our regional partners so that um, people have a clear understanding of what traffic safety issues are in their in their areas. Um, that's something that we're excited to do. We see an opportunity there. Um, we want to work with our partners to make sure that the crash data from the state is is released timely and in a way that really helps local municipalities um, react and and adjust their plans. Um, we hope that our data and research will help us predict outcomes. That's kind of a new approach in traffic safety, rather than reacting to um, high crash locations, but um, trying to design a system, a system systemic approach to um, making sure our roadways do not ever incur the crashes instead of reacting to them. And of course, we're going to, um, you know, do a best practices um, look at our peers and other ent entities, both federally and locally, to see. Um, how CMAP can help support um, information. So the third part of what we're doing with the action agenda are projects. Um, we kicked off a Flossmore local road safety plan recently. 
which will help CMAP understand what the local needs are in terms of traffic safety. We also did a recent call for projects on safety planning um, through our local technical assistance program. We hope that throughout the process of the next two years, we can provide in progress research and resources for local governments based on this work, whether again, that's data or other best practices. Um, we also hope that um, the results of this work are seen in the many project selection processes that CMAP oversees. So kind of raising the, the awareness of traffic safety as something that makes a project a, a really good idea and an important one to tackle. Next slide, please. So the last piece is, you know, developing tools and, and resources for our local governments. So we don't know exactly what these are going to be yet, but we can anticipate, as I mentioned, that that's going to be information and data. Um, it could be policy guidance for um, supporting long-term change. We could be looking at design guides that help local communities address things like speed management and complete streets. Um, and we, as I mentioned, we want to go beyond just engineering approaches. We're ready to tackle traffic safety from all of the dimensions um, that I mentioned earlier. Next slide. Great. So possible deliverables. This, these are kinds of ideas that we've been talking about internally, and we've, we've discussed them briefly with our resource group. A safety data portal could be something that we want to support and where we give information to local governments. Um, this regional systemic safety charter is something that is gaining some traction. Um, Vision Zero is a program that a lot of people have heard about. It's this systemic safety approach. And if there's an opportunity for us to adopt that and develop this safety culture regionally, that's something that we're looking to do. We would like to be able to support local governments in their decision making about design and policy. So um, speed management and bicycle and pedestrian safety, I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute, but those are topics where we might be able to help local governments with some um, best practices. Education and awareness, information and programs. I mean, to the extent, you know, CMAP has a voice in this region, how can we leverage that voice to support traffic safety? We're looking for opportunities there. And then um, the topic of equity enforcement is one that we're keeping a, a, our eye on. It's, it's an evolving one, and it's one that we want to address very carefully. We're looking at opportunities through education and best practices in enforcement to, to look at opportunities to do that the best way we can. We know that enforcement influences behavior. How can we um, kind of do the, the best possible job on that, on that topic? And then finally, designing our streets to support all modes and, and through complete streets policies, um, possibly a best practice there. As I mentioned, we had our first resource group meeting. Um, we're in the process of distilling and prioritizing the input we gathered there. You know, there was a lot of energy in this meeting. It was really exciting. Um, people were passionate about the topic and excited to dig in. Um, a lot of support for CMAP to take action in this in this realm um, and use the many faceted levers that we have to implement um, traffic safety improvements. There was some talk of using our less political status um, in terms of a contrast to local governments to address some of the really thornier issues. Um, there's a need for us to assemble knowledge from our you know federal leaders on the topic and also, um, understand what local needs are and kind of bridge the gap in implementation tools between the federal and the local. Um, how to prioritize projects was definitely um, a topic and, and what interventions have the maximum input in terms of improving intersection design and kind of putting those forward for local governments. Sharing data, as I mentioned, that's a topic with a lot of support and connecting projects to funding. So not only does CMAP help prioritize projects, but there are a lot of programs out there that do support safety, especially through the Illinois Department of Transportation. So how can we help connect our partners to projects there? 
And the other thing that we talked about in our first resource group meeting was um, kind of these consensus topics. These, these are topics regionally, they're also topics nationally. Um, speed management is something that is a growing concern. Excessive speeding seems to be on the rise, both regionally and nationally. So how can we help local governments address that? Um, and then bicycle and pedestrian safety. Uh, as I mentioned before the pandemic, there was a growing interest. We saw some mode splits increasing with more people biking and walking and the pandemic actually accelerated that interest as people looked for socially distant ways to travel or recreate. So we wanna make sure that we are supporting these kind of vulnerable modes the best way we can. And then there was also consensus on the fact that, you know, we're a planning agency, but Changing behavior is a big part of, of traffic safety and, and what are the best ways to do that and how can we help educate the region on those topics. So we're working internally now on the next steps. We'll plan a next resource group meeting. We're starting to unpack the, the data that we have available on our focus area topics to understand how we can best have an impact. Um, Data and metrics is a huge topic, understanding how people are traveling and at what speeds you know, on what types of roads is something that we're very interested in learning more about, but you need very specific data for that. Um, we are um, educating ourselves on the safe system approach and what that might look like regionally. That's this vision zero idea where you approach um, systemic safety rather than the reactive safety. And then we're also looking to peers. So for a regional agency to step into safety is not completely uncharted territory, but it's definitely new territory. So there are a few few other MPOs out there, and we're curious if you have any if you have any other resources here. Um, we're starting to do some peer review, understand what kind of programs um, an MPO could have that would support safety on a regional level. And I think that's it. I'd be happy to take any questions. Um, this is my email address. I welcome anybody um, a conversation about safety that you're concerned about in your area um, or ideas you have for or solving that going forward. Victoria, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, another excellent one uh, with a lot of great details. Uh, I'll leave it open one more time to any committee members for any follow-up questions. You know, I was listening to Adam's presentation, and and you know, freight is is a topic that will come up if we see this trend towards you know online and, and delivered orders. Um, maintain or increase, you know, that's a, we have an Illinois Trucking Association rep representative on our resource group, but it's definitely, um, you know, there's, there's traffic safety in all aspects, including freight. So we'll look forward to keeping you updated. Victoria, thank you very much for your presentation. Okay, we're going to turn it over to the eighth agenda item uh, with uh, Cecilia Diaz, Transportation Planner for the uh, Cook County Department of Transportation, and uh, she's going to talk about the Lincoln Highway Logistics Corridor Strategic Plan. And on a personal note, I just want to thank Cecilia for all of her uh, uh, assistance with the CREATE program launch, uh, our new website or renewed website that we launched and all the input that she provided. So would encourage uh, those on the committee if you haven't recently visited the CREATE program website at createprogram.org uh, to do so, because uh, we, we now are into the 21st century and can use, you can actually view it through your mobile device. <laughs> Very exciting. Cecilia, I'll let you take it away. 
Thank you, Herbert. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity um, that I have here uh, with you all today. Um, again, uh, my name is Cecilia Diaz. I'm a transportation planner. Uh, I actually work in the team, uh, the freight team under the Department of Transportation and Highways. Uh, I have uh, also joining me here, uh, Sam and uh, Jesse. And it's, it's, it's funny because I, I got you listed at the end of the slide so they can contact you if they didn't like this presentation. <laughs> Um, so uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, well, yeah, let's go to the next slide, but I, I do want to uh, let you know that it's been about two years since we presented uh, this uh, at, at this committee. Um, so I'm gonna probably uh, go a little bit over the plan to, to get everyone up to date on uh, what got us here. Um, and I will briefly uh, summarize the Lincoln Highway Logistic Corridor uh, Strategic Plan um, it basically it's a focus on the industrial area of the Chicago Heights, Ford Heights, and Sauk Village. Um, I will also discuss Cook County Department's uh, grant funding uh, to address the rail and the road infrastructure for some of the sites that we identified, as well as support uh, for the environmental assessment and remediation within the corridor uh, of, of the study. Uh, additionally, I will highlight the economic development, which is really the, 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 the cornerstone of this project um, and other funding opportunities, uh, as well as marketing um, that we have done for this area. And then finally, I will briefly discuss the uh, potential task, uh, tax relief legislation for this site. Um, and uh, the corridor uh, really needs a, a lot of support as a result. And then finally, um, we're gonna talk about the next steps uh, to keep this project moving. Next slide. And the next slide. All right, so what are we talking about? Uh, if you look at your uh, map, uh, it may not be clear, and I apologize for that, but it is considered the Lincoln Highway Logistic Corridor Study Area. Uh, it encompasses, um, uh, you could see uh, Chicago Heights to the west, to the east, you have Ford Heights. To the south would be Sauk Village. This, these are all communities located in the south suburbs of Chicago. Um, and how we got here, originally SSMMA identified an industrial area within the villages of Chicago Heights, Ford Heights, and Sauk Village. And they needed to help to understand why there was no investment uh, area that was underutilized and there was excellent uh, location uh, to roads and rails. Initially, uh, as we got engaged with this plan, uh, thanks to the uh, funding of IDOT, uh, we were going to leverage new transportation investments in the corridor to increase industrial development, which believe, we, we believed at that time was the issue. However, as the plan progressed, it, it became clear additionally uh, that uh, just to increase access to rail and highways would not be enough. Uh, we needed to further uh, collaborate uh, among the county departments, uh, both in environmental remediation, as well as engage economic development in order to see any movement. Um, and so that's what we, we uh, set apart. Uh, so next slide. Uh, but first, we needed to do an analysis. Uh, just because we think we got something and we have a problem and we've identified it doesn't mean that it is, right? Uh, so during our analysis, we did uh, various uh, methods such as industrial review, case studies of similar transportation environments. Uh, we talked to stakeholders within the area. We looked at strengths, weaknesses, uh, and more importantly, which we didn't think we would dig into would be the uh, preliminary environmental and site assessments of those sites and uh, a pin review of who owned what, as well as funding and financing uh, opportunities as well. So we wanted to be a, a holistic plan. Uh, what this led us to was to identify about 20 prime sites within this uh, corridor. And uh, what we did is we did a systematic measurement, um, in other words, criteria that we could evenly distribute across those sites. And, um, and what were the criteria? Uh, you'll see a snippet on this slide, but uh, it was environmental risk, 
parcel size and ownership. What are we talking about, right? Uh, transportation access, readiness for utilities, um, how effective uh, or affected were they uh, at flood plains and wetlands, tax environment, zoning and land use, and workers access. We wanted to be, again, holistic uh, when we measured them. Uh, the plan was completed in 2018 and was presented with recommendations uh, to stakeholders in uh, August of 2018, as well as other partners. Next slide. Uh, and so uh, if you recall what you saw initially, we had this like, uh, slip, snippet of uh, an area that we wanted to focus on and now we're honing in in and this is what we honed in we honed in about 10 sites uh where we looked at the cost preparation uh what did the utility sites look like um site transportation access environmental access remediation uh stormwater retention and clearing from the the corridor and these 10 sites uh we concluded that would cost about 11 million dollars uh if uh they were addressed and so um what we looked at was not only just seeing how much it would cost but also per site you know what were uh, some of opportunities such as grants and loans uh that could facilitate improvement in this area um and then once we uh completed it uh we uh then found a way to market it um so next slide please um we do want to caveat that uh we did do an, a deep analysis on the uh, freight access um of this particular area uh in in terms of the roadway it, it was actually excellent um uh, you know it's connected to the illinois 57 uh, Illinois 394, um, as well as US 30, Lincoln Highway, Joe Orr Road, uh, Sock Village, and other arterials. Um, and then another thing to note uh, for the road access is there's an improvement in the Sock Village uh, uh, in, in relations to the Logistics Center, which is along the Illinois 394. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, and in terms of the, the railroad access, uh, the plan also identified a road in, uh, rail improvement that would make multiple development sites attractive to end users. Uh, so it would be at the cost of whoever wanted to develop that. Um, and so that is going to be an ongoing discussion with uh, CN and UP Railroad uh, to see what other, are other potentials uh, in that corridor. Next slide, please. So. Uh, what we learned <laughs> since the publication of this plan, uh, the implementation effort uh, did require close coordinations across uh, Cook County agencies. And in particular, I'm going to highlight the Department of Transportation Highways, the Department of Environmental and Sustainability, and uh, the Bureau of Economic Development, and, and also in partnership uh, with the three municipalities because, uh, let's face it, these are the folks uh, that are considered our customers. Um, and then um, in close collaboration with SSMMA, uh, who originally brought this uh, to our attention, as well as the Chicago Southland Economic Development and Corporation. So I'm going to uh, go to the next slide and we're going to talk about uh, what uh, the Department of Transportation or DOF did. Uh, the first thing, uh, right off the bat, uh, in 2018, uh, Sock Village uh, submitted an application for uh, phase one engineering for road and rail extension to talk about uh, what I mentioned earlier, which is the logistic uh, logistic center. And that would not only improve the roadway, but also the rail. And so uh, that was a big uh, win for that Sock Village uh, project. Uh, the other um, study that Cook County wanted to uh, move forward with uh, is an estimate of a cost of water, sanitation, and storm uh, sewer extension um, that would also include uh, road improvement as part of the plan. Unfortunately, that had to be on hold um, because there was something more important than that, and it had to do with the water infrastructure for the fort, uh, for the uh, village of Fort Heights. 
Uh, and I'll, I'll actually discuss uh, a little bit more about that and how that got addressed. And finally, uh, from the Department of Transportation, we do have ongoing work. Uh, we just opened up the Invest in Cook for 2021, and uh, we are looking uh, forward to potentially two more projects uh, from this corridor to continue the effort. Next slide, please. From the Department of Environmental and Sustainability, um, first of all, let's let's just call them what they are. They are a regulatory department. Uh, but in in uh, 2014, uh, they got into uh, an opportunity to uh, do an application with US EPA for brownfield assessment, and they were uh, awarded it. Uh, not only were they awarded, but they also did uh, tremendous work in the West Cook County uh, area. And as a result, uh, they applied again in 2018 um, and was awarded two uh, grants. Um, one is for assessment grant. And uh, what that means is it uh, utilizes and conducts environmental site assessments to identify contamination at sites, including uh, some Lincoln Highway Logistic Corridor um, priority sites, which we've identified in the plan. Uh, the second award that was uh, presented was uh, about 750000 and it was called Revolving Loan Fund. This fund uh, provides a low interest loan for cleanup efforts for parties interested in developing these Browning sites. Some of the Lincoln Highway Logistic Corridor sites are among the first candidates to receive the environmental assessment activities under the US EPA grant. So in working with DOTH, BED, DES is offering funding through three channels. Um, and I didn't talk about PACE. Uh, there's something that came new, uh, which is the um, Commercial Property Assessment Clean Energy uh, Financing Program. Um, and it, it, it has just a lot of muscles to support uh, development um, in, in the Cook County region. And um, for, for now, what I'd like to, to present is uh, additional efforts from economic development, uh, as well as we're going to talk about tax analysis and the marketing. So next slide, please. And these are the tools that the economic development uh, has in its, its arsenal, if you will. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to list them, but uh, all I could say is that they use it in a layering method, uh, either to acquire land or buildings, to rehab uh, or do new, do new construction, uh, purchase machineries for uh, equipment for businesses, uh, do assessment and remediation. And we talked about that in the environmental side. Uh, so this is a collaborative effort between these two agencies and then environmentally friendly um, improvements. Um, but I really want to hone in on the uh, CDBG funds. Uh, thanks to the Bureau of Economic Development, uh, they were really the spear uh, in the last two years uh, for the village of Ford Heights. Um, some of the projects that they completed were a uh, capital improvement plan, uh, which was initiated to support the village of Ford Heights to identify priority projects there was uh, the green streets which was a uh, engineering design uh, through cdbg and mwrd this uh, basically covers the uh, engineering cost uh, for uh, a street project it's at 95 percent design complete and uh, just a few things are remaining but um, it, it, it's well underway it's also going to address some of the flooding issues uh, that seems to uh, affect this area a lot. And also, uh, uh, DOTH has committed to assist in the routine maintenance of uh, scheduling on-site ass uh, assess analysis to begin April 2021. And I, I, I kind of go back to that uh, study that I mentioned that DOTH was going to initiate, which is the utility study. And the reason why we couldn't move forward is because the uh, water main improvement project was underway. Um, so what that meant is that the Fort Heights uh, did not have a water main atlas and it was obsolete actually. And not only that, but uh, there was a strong detection of leakage as well as a, a repair program in dire need. 
And so we, we uh, took a step back on the project that we wanted to do in order for this to, to come forward. Um, and finally, in, uh, under the uh, BED program, there's something called Elevate Energy. Um, and basically, this is, uh, this is a project that will uh, be working with uh, various uh, communities, uh, especially during the south, south suburbs, to provide technical assistance and uh, direct uh, coordination with program implementations and vendors uh, to complete energy efficiency and solar projects. Uh, so there's a, there is a couple of uh, uh, cities that jumped aboard on that, and, um, and there's just many more projects uh, underway. Next slide, please. The biggest thing for us uh, is not only to identify that rail, road, um, assessments and, and assets, but we realized that the tax, uh, the property tax really needed to be addressed. Um, uh, the extensive review of the existing condition data revealed that very few pins in the corridor generated substantial uh, shares of all property tax revenue. And of those pins, uh, they were mostly industrial properties. This presented a tremendous upside opportunity for this, uh, this uh, study area. Today, these sites are primarily uh, agricultural, vacant, or exempt, and as a result, generate little revenue. However, tax rates are so high in Lincoln Highway Logistic Corridor uh, that the three towns were struggling against Northwest Indiana and uh, Will County. I mean, the rates at this point is between 11% and 34%, which is well above Will County and Northwest Indiana. Our research suggested that the tax equivalent to a $1 per square footage of developed space would be competitive with peer locations, uh, as I've mentioned. Uh, logis uh, legislation that could apply to the $1 square foot uh, as a starting rate would then grow incrementally for the next 20 years to match uh, the neighbors really for, for Cook County and to uh, generate new revenue and support uh, development. Uh, at this point, the county has previously uh, prepared a tax uh, legislation to um, address the Lincoln Highway Logistic Corridor uh, through our analysis, and we hope to move this uh, in Springfield soon. Uh, we are currently reaching out to our uh, municipality uh, partners um, and hope that they're still on board with this legislation. And uh, additionally, we are aware that SSMMA has submitted an updated version of their Southland Reactivation Act, but uh, this bill is uh, we see as a complementary uh, to our bill. Um, and next slide, please. All right. So one of the things I've mentioned earlier on was that we did a marketing um, uh, I'm honestly, a, a marketing campaign. Uh, we, we did this uh, nifty little uh, slide. Uh, we did it online. Uh, we had our partners participate uh, back in 2019. And basically this was just a high level information uh, that told a, a story about this area. And uh, it, it also uh, included pool sheets of each and every one of these sites, uh, along with contacts of who a uh, 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 interested developer needed to contact uh, from which municipality uh, based on the site. So, so we really made it as easy as possible. And we were able in 2019 uh, to, to go out to the real estate conferences, uh, brokerage communities. Uh, we actually sent uh, representatives to Select USA in DC. Uh, we did brownfield opportunity zones and other um, regional economic development events. Uh, unfortunately, there was a pause last year um, and we hope to continue this effort uh, moving forward in 2021. Next slide, please. All right, so what are our next steps? Next slide. We've got a lot actually. <laughs> Uh, two years isn't enough to kind of get that plan uh, 100% going. Um, I will say, I'd be happy to, to say that actually two of the 10 sites that we I deemed as, uh, as a priority has been uh, developed and purchased by private market. And uh, I, I think that while we, we would like to 
you know, take the ownership that that was us. Uh, it was actually the villages themselves uh, that were uh, strong in continuing, continuing the effort. Um, but we realized that frequent and close coordination, uh, along with these ongoing efforts that are listed here, uh, will achieve that full potential that we're hoping to, to accomplish. Uh, as we continue to uh, do ongoing in, uh, initiatives, uh, we remain actually uh, uh, dedicated. Uh, we actually, our team uh, for Cook County meets every two months. Uh, so this has not been forgotten. Uh, through this process, we've developed new lines of communication across the agencies uh, and government, which uh, positions us to adapt to any change uh, in the landscape. Um, we would like to deepen our understanding of the needs of the local businesses, and we intend to reach out uh, to the existing industries of the stakeholder groups uh, for these continued efforts. Next slide. And that actually wraps up my um, presentation. Uh, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity uh, to kind of keep you updated uh, on our efforts. And uh, this is uh, on, below is the website for the actual um, uh, presentation, uh, not presentation, but uh, for our, our package. And then um, my information is attached here. And at this time, I could take any questions if, if anyone has anything. Cecilia, I just wanted to make one comment. Um, excellent presentation. Um, just as um, it's that time of year again that I, you know, a lot of the efforts that we've, I think, have been able to advance as part of this project has been through uh, our Invest in Cook um, grant program. And it, just in case anyone on this call uh, doesn't know our uh, investing code program for 2021 is open right now uh, with applications due on March 12th. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that um, as a uh, addendum to the uh, to your presentation. But also, uh, as of note, my uh, email is Samuel S A M U E L dot right at Cook County Help dot gov. Sam, I did that just to see if you were paying attention. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Cecilia, a, a question for you. You know, brownfield redevelopment. Uh, you know, kind of it. It, it has its challenges uh, with with Region Five's uh, involvement on assessments. Um, does it? What What was your experience going through this? Uh, work working with the locals of getting the site assessments performed in a timely basis and then knowing what you're getting into for site remediation to prepare it for industrial redevelopment? Uh, good question, uh, Mr. Murtha. Uh, to be quite honest with you, um, there there is so much opportunities for brownfield assessment. Um, I, I believe that the bandwidth of the communities is really where the challenge is. Uh, just because uh, right now they're focusing, as I mentioned, with just uh, uh, Ford Heights, uh, all, all the, the water infrastructure, you know, it's almost like there's like this, pri there's so many lists of things that need to be addressed that the priority uh, really takes the effort. Uh, in this case, it's the water main and, and the, uh, the flooding issues. But at some point they're going to pivot and then they're going to say, okay, the brownfield assessment needs to be next. Um, but it, it really, it takes a matter of just uh, changing the, the, the focus um, that we have the availability um, to support them. We actually have the funding. We're going to extend that uh, because we did not utilize it for all the sites, which is what we were hoping for. Again, this is for Village, uh, um, Sauk Village. Chicago Heights has been use, utilizing it tremendously. Um, Sauk Village, uh, not as much. Uh, I think they used it for a couple of sites, but uh, Village of uh, Fort Heights really has so many uh, that they could use uh, and they're, it's on pause for that. But, um, but I think that uh, just having it is a great thing. Um, and uh, the, the plus up for how to be utilized, uh, you know, our, um, 
our partners uh, in DES, uh, the Department of Environmental and Sustainability, uh, really just bends, bends over backwards to try to help them out uh, to get that initiative moving. They realize that there's still mo more work to be done. And um, they've actually have a, a, a study going on uh, to see how they can assist um, uh, the partners there, so so they're, they they haven't forgotten it, but I think that there's still more to more more uh, effort that needs to occur there. Any additional questions for Cecilia? Hearing none, uh, Cecilia, th thank you very much. Uh, that was a, another great presentation and. Uh, Brown, Brownfield redevelopment uh, is is something that I I think uh, as we as we focus on the potential new transportation infrastructure bill in Congress, uh, there's there's a opportunity to to really accelerate redevelopment of of these sites. Uh, so thank you again for a, a great overview. Um, Tom Murtha, our frequent flyer. Uh, are you going to have enough time uh, for your presentation or would you like us to kick it to the, the next meeting? Well, I, my dry run was 15, was 14 minutes. So, okay. Well, well we're, we're going to, we're going to, to, to try our best then to sneak in here. So okay. Tom Martha is going to give us an update as our ninth agenda item on um, planning and environmental linkages. Uh, so please Tom, take it away. Okay, great. So, so I want to talk about the planning and environmental linkages studies that we're engaged in. We're looking at a couple grade separations and uh, going to focus on Laraway Road, which is uh, in the Joliet freight cluster. Um, the reason why we're really interested in this is to is to jumpstart uh, some priority locations for grade crossings, uh, reduce the risks uh, for uh, uh, municipalities as they as they move forward so that they really under better understand the cost and scope and uh, don't get into a uh, phase one process where they're kind of stuck either you know having to repay the, the funds because they can't proceed with the project or really kind of uh, uh, absorbing costs that they never really understood going into the going into the process so next slide please all right, and then uh, so so the uh, I'm going to talk about the grade crossing issues to as a general introduction. Uh, go over the the Laraway Road project. Talk about our timelines and budgets, and then and address any comments if there are any. Next, next, we have about six more than 1,600 grade crossings in the region with 1,200 more than 1,200 daily trains. Uh, so next next crossing or next slide. Uh, we have set a target for reducing delay uh, for these. This is average delay uh, for the for the crossings. So next uh, next slide. Uh, we do recognize that there is some delay that we haven't been able to take into account uh, where crossings are blocked for longer periods of time. Uh, so. This is some data that we collected as part of the, the CN uh, uh, acquisition of the EJ&E. Um, next slide. But overall, using the data that we've got, uh, we uh, looked at delay, crash risk, uh, truck volumes and transit impacts to, uh, to prioritize crossings. Uh, uh, next slide. Using that numerical ranking, we uh, uh, we ranked the top 150 crossings and then prioritized 400, four, or excuse me, 47 uh, individual locations or groups of crossings among those. So, and then uh, what we're going to talk about is the is the process to actually move forward the studies of of those priority locations. Next. So, and that process is a new federal process called the Planning and Environmental Linkages process. Next. So, what the what the Pell process does is allows uh, a planning study to take place that uh, that really informs the uh, the Phase One engineering process, the 
the environmental process uh, that really kicks off a, a typical project study. So with an with a PELP study, we can we can uh, engage in stakeholder communication, uh, develop a, a draft purpose and need, alternatives to be carried forward, um, uh, the identification of those potential alternatives, and then recommending the uh, uh, the that those few alternatives that based on analysis. And then finally, the Pell report, which is federally approved. Next. So uh, our process uh, involves working with the Federal Highway Administration and IDOT, but also in conjunction with uh, with the local agency. In the in the in the context of Laraway, that would be that would be the city of Joliet. Next. And uh, this and so here's kind of what where we all the things that are involved in the process. Uh, stakeholder involvement is is key throughout the process. Uh, we have had a round of, of public involvement, but we'll be reaching out to, to stakeholders, including including those on the on the on the call, Elaine, Eric, uh, Colin, and and C. Steve is is uh, uh, with us too, and then uh, uh, to to uh, explain what, where we are with the with the recommended alternatives. Next, or the alternatives to be carried forward. Excuse me. So so let's let's talk about Laraway Road. Next. Uh, as you see here, with these check boxes, we are fairly far along in the in the, in the uh, project development process already. Next, uh, we have engaged stakeholders uh, substantially. Uh, our website was launched in May of of last year, and has been kept up to date. Next. Uh, we had 400 people visit the site during the survey period. 93 people uh, completed our survey, including uh, more than half of those were truck uh, were truck drivers. Next, and I have a little video to explain the project a little bit. So roll tape, please. The Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning (CMAP) is undertaking a study of Laraway Road from Illinois Route 53 to Brandon Road in Will County, Illinois. The study is focused on the at-grade or level crossing of Laraway Road at the Union Pacific Railroad. In 2019, Laraway Road was one of 47 at-grade railroad crossings prioritized for further study or improvement by CMAP and its partner agencies. A few facts. In 2019, CMAP counted 22 trains over a full day, consisting of 10 Amtrak trains, six freight trains, and six trains switching over the crossing. Counting false activations, the gates were lowered 25 times during the day. On Laraway Road, IDOT recently estimated traffic volumes at 10,700 vehicles daily. In 2018, CMAP counted 8,700 vehicles, about three-fourths of which were trucks. Indeed, this section of Laraway Road is in an industrial area that generates many truck trips. The speed limit on Laraway Road is 40 miles an hour. But substantial delay is a big concern at the crossing, particularly for truckers who are trying to meet delivery deadlines. During our observations, Amtrak trains block the crossing for only a minute each. But freight trains block the crossing an average of nine minutes each, with a maximum blockage of almost 17 minutes. Such long gate blockages cause extensive queues of trucks to form on Laraway. Just four trucks carrying 53-foot trailers can extend the length of a football field. Westbound blockages routinely extend back a half mile through the intersection with Route 53, while eastbound blockages routinely extend to Brandon Road. When the gates rise, eastbound queues platoon to the Route 53 intersection, but the limited green time for left-turning trucks causes the queues to break up only slowly. Queues resulting from the gate blockages, but also from truck traffic volumes exceeding capacity, frequently back up from the Route 53 intersection onto the railroad tracks, as seen here. U.S. and Illinois law prohibit trucks from entering a railroad crossing unless the truck has sufficient room on the other side of the crossing to completely clear the crossing, but trucks have frequently been seen on the crossing blocking it, as shown on the video. Adding to the delay, 
Some vehicles are required to turn on flashers and stop at most at-grade crossings. At Laraway Road, these vehicles include a few school buses and transit vehicles, but are mostly trucks carrying hazardous materials. Many of the trucks carrying hazardous materials are tanker trucks, but also include containers, stake beds carrying gases, and semi-trailers. CMAP counted 73 safety stops at the crossing over 24 hours, but as you might see at a stop sign, only about half of the vehicles came to a complete stop, and four of those stopping did not stop at the stop mark. The crossing gates frequently require repairs, often because of trucks striking the gates. Over the past six years, the gates have required an average of 44 repairs per year, with 20 per year indicating that there was a gate hit, broke, or knocked by a vehicle. The time required to repair the gates has been about one hour 45 minutes for the past two years, but was substantially higher in previous years. The crossing must often be closed for such repairs. All of this has substantial costs, including vehicle delay, reduced reliability for truck drivers, police response, and the actual cost of the gate repairs. CMAP's study is employing the Federal Planning and Environmental Linkages, or PEL, process to develop a draft purpose and need, identification and evaluation of alternatives, one or more alternatives to be carried forward for further analysis, and a planning level cost estimate of the alternatives to be carried forward. This segment of Layerway Road is under the jurisdiction of the City of Joliet. While the City of Joliet has not committed to proceeding with additional engineering or construction for Layerway Road, the study will help the City determine the need, scope, and cost of a potential improvement, thus assisting the City in the decision-making process. For more information about this study, see engage.cmap.illinois.com. Gov. Thank you. Okay, so I hope that was helpful in understanding the, the project. So this is uh, uh, what we summarized as the purpose and need. We want to improve mobility, we want to improve safety, and we want to improve travel time reliability for our, for our freight partners. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, we, to, to, to meet those needs, we studied a number of alternatives. We identified alternatives and, 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 and did some evaluation. So uh, we, uh, for the railroad crossing, we looked at the, the road raised over the railroad, the railroad raised over the road, the road lowered and the railroad lo lowered. Because of utilities and so forth, the railroad, the, the, lower, the lowering uh, process didn't really, uh, um, uh, wasn't practical. Uh, and then the, uh, among the impacts, well, next slide. Uh, the, the least amount of impacts was, was really the, the road raised over the railroad. So, so that is the, uh, the uh, alternative for the crossing that we're carrying forward to phase one engineering. Next one. And the analysis included you know, all of these factors, again, that, that road over really uh, shown among the crossing. Next. We also had to look at delay overall in the crossings, and we looked at a number of uh, intersection improvements that, uh, capacity improvements and intersection improvements that, uh, uh, that improved operations at 53. As we mentioned in the, in the video, uh, a lot of delay occurs at this intersection. So these are alternatives that improve capacity at, at, on Laraway Road. Next, we, al we also looked at uh, alternative intersections. Next roundabout and then and then uh, uh, a couple alternatives with what's called displaced left turns or, or continuous flow intersections these were not practical because of access uh, considerations uh, next uh, of the improvements on on for capacity on Laraway road uh, several we moved forward or a couple we moved forward that gave adequate service for uh, uh, for the uh, Laraway road uh, so alternatives three and four here. Next. So again, the evaluation pointed to those. Next. Uh, we also looked at improvements on 53 itself. The uh, IDOT requested that, that we evaluate those. 
We looked at a continuous flow intersection that uh, that added intersections on, on 53 to move traffic, left turning traffic better. Next. And some uh, and some alternatives on on 53. Uh, uh, next, uh, but the uh, dangers of moving forward with the project on 53 with drainage problems in that area really pointed away from aggressively uh, uh, leaving a, a, a state highway improvement in the hands of a municipal agency when the when again the the, the uh, some of the uh, practical issues of construction weren't addressed. So next. So uh, we are left with, for the intersection, alternatives three and four, and an alternative seven where we're adding dual lefts on Route 53 to move forward. So next, next slide. Um, so in summary, for the grade crossing, we're moving forward with, uh, with the Laraway Road over for phase one, next. And, uh, and these three intersection alternatives. So next slide again. Uh, next, we'll talk about a little bit about the budget. So we're, we're spending with our consultant uh, partners about a thousand hours on Laraway Road uh, of consultant time to, to get to this point. Next. And that for uh, for the next project that we're working on, we're in the midst of data collection for in, in Burwin Riverside. It's about 1,500 hours. So again, about half again what what uh, Larry Road was expected to cost us. So um, and then next slide, we're uh, expect this will run somewhat less than well about $350,000 overall, and uh, the the uh, uh, Laraway is expected to be wrapped up uh, a little bit later this year, and then the the uh, Berwyn Riverside project uh, a little bit later next year. So um, again, uh, we, you know, helping the communities understand the, the the projects and to really jump the jumpstart these projects. Understanding is is uh, uh, really kind of what we're trying to do, and and we hope we're we're we've succeeded. Uh, at least at first with uh, with, with Laraway Road. Uh, and with that, I think that's the my last slide and I'm happy to answer any questions. And next. Tom, that's an excellent overview. I, I, I love the video and the analysis that was performed. That was uh, eye-opening to me. We, we explain about the dangers of uh, great crossings and the safe, the safest great crossing is the one that doesn't exist in the region. That's right. Uh, and and just looking at the the number of counts of the the broken arms, uh, the the gates, uh, and the the rolling stops that occur, the the human factor and this is, you know, that video was eye opening even to me. So, uh, excellent presentation. Any other questions? I just, uh, this is Colin from Will County. <clears throat> I would like to point out that uh, this, pro the Thoroughway Road project could have been a lot worse. Uh, there was a elementary school nearby the intersection. They have since uh, moved to a new location. So you would have had buses uh, involved with uh, the study as well. So, but uh, fortunately, that's no longer an issue. Um, uh, I just wanted to say thank you uh, for the presentation and also your UNC Maps uh, role in sort of taking on the Pell study, I think, as one of the first people in the region, at least for a grade crossing. Um, it's definitely helped us at, at Cook County um, identify and, and try to uh, you know, address some of the grade crossings in the region, whether they're create projects or or just some of the other uh, priority grade crossings, um, getting some of those projects kicked off with with Pell studies that hopefully we will uh, do that as well uh, soon. So I just want to thank you for uh, for presenting on this and and uh, definitely giving us a lot of help and and ideas for how we can move forward as well. Thank you. Well, Tom, thank, thank you again for your presentation and for, for sticking to your time. 
uh, we we uh, were able to get it in then. Um, and with that, I think we're going to move to any new business that committee members wanted to bring up. All right. Let's see, uh, this is Colin with Will County. Uh, one of the things that uh, that's coming about in the near future uh, are going to be electric uh, vehicle trucks uh, hauling our goods. And uh, my question is, are we as a region prepared for this this kind of uh, vehicle? Uh, so I would like to see something like that uh, taken up by this committee uh, uh, in, in the near future. Thank you. I believe something something to the tune of uh, 500,000 charging stations. Sec Secretary Buttigieg has proposed as part of an infrastructure bill, um, and, and it, it would be timely to uh, have CMAP take a leadership role in analyzing where logically uh, those those additional stations should be rolled out. Uh, Ray, Ray Drake, turn turn it over to you, uh, knowing that UPS has made an initial investment with some uh, you know electric vehicles um what what are your thoughts on where where the technology is and where the analysis for cmap would be most productive the uh, well in terms of the technology i mean for heavy trucks electric is still a work in progress um there's a lot of you know testing going on with it right now uh, I haven't had a recent update on where that is exactly going and what the timeline, what the timeline looks like, but I can certainly get some some uh, updated information if uh, if there is interest. Uh, in terms of smaller vehicles, uh, which would be say uh, typ typically your your parcel delivery vehicle. Um, there is, there would be application for uh, usage there of electric vehicles with right now, it, but our climatic conditions in, in Illinois are not conducive for that in our, at least in UPS's estimation from a year round perspective. And uh, right now, although we, we are evaluating and using electric vehicles uh, in some other areas of the country where it's uh, more climatically friendly, uh, we have not made that that step yet. And that again is, is sort of a technology issue, it, and not that it will not be uh, feasible in the future. But at this point in time, having a vehicle say out uh, in in cold weather um, for you know nine ten hours. Um, with stop and start type driving, um, that there are some concerns right there, at least uh, uh, what our, my uh, automotive technology group tells me. And that may change, of course. That will change. It's just a question of when. Well, it's, it sounds like uh, there may be an opportunity, Ray, to, for if, if you'd be interested in bringing, you know, your your internal experts to give a presentation on the subject if you know of, of how the region should be thinking about this uh, given the timeliness of it the gm announcement of 30 all electric vehicles by 2025 uh, kind of the 14 models of class class 8 trucks that they're looking at developing in the next couple of years that are electric that would be that would be an interesting discussion Certainly uh, facilitating something like that, but but and, and I really think uh, probably even better spokespersons for that if if we wanted to get you know some outside speakers actually from the the manufacturers and the technology companies that are behind this, they probably will give you the I, I think you know the most authoritative insights since those are the people that are actually manufacturing the vehicles. But I can I could more than happy to assist in that process. 
Great. Yeah, if, if, if your folks have any recommendations of which OEMs we should be reaching out to, that'd be great. Sure, sure. But, but you know, in, in terms, you know, when you're talking about, you know, longer range planning, I, I think, you know, definitely, uh, or even mid-range planning, you know, definitely this is something that needs to be under full consideration. Because it's not a question of if, it's just a question of when. Any other new business items that the committee would like to raise? Okay, hearing, hearing none, we'll move to the public comment period. Uh, this is an opportunity for those who have stuck with us for two hours and 10 minutes uh, to uh, share any comments that uh, you would like to share with the committee. Hi, Herbert, this is Garland Armstrong calling. How you doing? Good, Garland. Yeah, just want you to know we're still here, but there's a foot of snow in Des Moines, Iowa. So we're gonna wait until when the snow leaves. And I also just want you to know tomorrow's my birthday. I'll be 55 years old. And also too, I just wanna bring up to especially what happened here in Des Plaines. Sometimes the signals right here for the great crossing, it was down. I was on the bus going to Jules and it was down for more than 15 minutes since there was no, no, tr no freight train coming. And sometimes the, sometimes the truck drivers think about going around it and the Des Plaines police um, stop to make sure that don't try to attempt to do, go around the gates when they're stuck down. So I just want you to know that we need to make sure that all the truck drivers in different languages, if they're driving, that they make sure never to try to go around the gates when they're stuck down because sometimes they should have a backup plan whenever something like this, they should have someone who to contact whenever something like this happens because sometimes it's like a lack of communication when they when the truck drivers don't have access how to contact someone when something like this happens down the road so i think you need to work on something like that to make sure from all different languages even if they can't speak english how to make sure that they will get the access they need for it because it's time now for them to make sure that they get it so that they'll have the resources and everything what they need because they feel like they don't have it at all. Well, first off, Garland, uh, let me be one of the first to say happy birthday to you. And I, I, I know that I share with all the committee members that we're wishing you a happy birthday tomorrow. Thank you very much for, for your input. It's very valued. And I will share that information again with my colleague at the BNSF Railroad. All right, Herbert, thanks a lot. Other questions from public? Going once, going twice. Okay, uh, our next meeting is planned for May 17th at 10 a.m. Ryan, before we adjourn, did I miss anything? Uh, no, I, I think you have everything. I, I just want to add, I know we had a pretty packed agenda. So if there's any slides uh, you wanted to revisit, um, those are located on the website. Uh, this meeting has also been recorded and will be posted to the website later uh, this week. So you can always go back and revisit. Great. Uh, well, with, with that, uh, I, I thank everyone for sticking with us for almost two hours and 15 minutes. Uh, a lot of great information and looking forward to the, the May committee hearing. Uh, with that, uh, we are now adjourned. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.